thanks for joining us. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events and in-store events by visiting our website at powells.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're excited to host Jack E. Davis in conversation with Jonathan Miper, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Gulf. Mr. Davis now delivers The Bald Eagle, the improbable journey of America's bird, a sweeping cultural and natural history of the bald eagle in America. For centuries, Americans have celebrated it as majestic and noble, yet savage the living bird behind their national symbol as a malicious predator of livestock and falsely a kidnapper of human babies. Taking us from before the nation's founding through inconceivable resurgences of this enduring all-American species, Davis contrasts the age when native peoples lived beside bald eagles peacefully to more recent generations where we find the species at the brink of extinction. Filled with spectacular stories of founding fathers, rapacious hunters, heroic bird rescuers, and the lives of bald eagles themselves, monogamous creatures considered among the animal world's finest parents. The bald eagle is a much awaited cultural and natural history that demonstrates how the bird's wondrous journey may provide inspiration today as we grapple with environmental peril on a larger scale. Jack is joining us tonight from Gainesville, Florida, and he'll be joined in conversation by Jonathan Myberg, author of the book, A Most Remarkable Creature, The Hidden Life of the World's Smartest Birds of Prey. He's also the leader of the acclaimed band Shearwater, and he's joining us tonight from just outside of Austin, Texas. We thank him for being part of tonight's event. This evening's event also includes an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. And perhaps most importantly, please support Jack and Powell's by purchasing copies of The Bald Eagle from us. A link to buy that book as well as a link to buy Jonathan's book will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Jack, Jonathan, so happy to have you both with us tonight. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us, uh, Kevin. Jonathan, thanks for uh, joining me this evening. Oh, of course. It's great to see you again. Uh, yeah, Jack and I were, were, uh, were neighbors briefly for about a year in, in Florida. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, but we, you know, only saw each other in the flesh one, once, I think, or twice. <laughs> but uh, Jack, I, 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 I loved your book. Um, and I think it's a really special and, and in many ways important book. Uh, and I, I wondered if you if we could open this uh, with a short reading from it. Oh, sure, I, I'll be happy to. Um, I'll uh, I'll read the opening few paragraphs of of, of the book. And uh, and I should say, Jonathan, by the way, that the um, the um, the the neighborhood here in in, in Gainesville is diminished for your absence. So. <laughs> You're welcome back anytime. At, at any place where there's uh, there's uh, white ibises just walking around uh, yeah. on people's lawns, it's yeah. pretty special. Yeah, it is pretty special. Standing at the rocky edge of a stream, a bald eagle scans its surroundings with luminous eyes. Satisfied, it, un it unfurls its wings straight up, drops into a crouch, and in one fluid motion pushes skyward sweeping a seven foot wingspan out and down. The eagle rises slowly at first, legs and feet hanging like pendants. His powerful wings beat hard against the air and it continues to rise. Limbs draw up for the journey ahead. Nesting season has come to its inevitable end and migration has begun. As fall slips toward winter, bald eagles across Western Alaska have been called to a, a distant place a place they pursue annually throughout their lifetimes, as did their ancestors in their lifetimes. Their exodus from seasonal territories proceeds not in a mass or in crowded waves. There are no herding calls sounded to a group, no flocks gathering for takeoff, no wedges of flight piercing the sky. Instead, each bird, even the young ones not long from the nest, 
follows its own impulse to leave. And over a period of weeks, thousands of eagles set out individually on a solitary journey duplicated by multitudes. Seeking a southwesterly course, wind in their faces, sun on their backs, they eventually roll out over the Aleutian Islands. Each island in the trackless sea below is an ancient link in a migration route mapped in the eagle's evolutionary memory. Tracing it from several hundred feet to several thousand feet up, they continue to fly solo, loosely spaced a half a mile or more apart in streams 20 to 30 miles long. Soaring on favorable winds where they exist and pumping wings providently where they don't. Each passing day grows stingier with light, granting barely six hours between the dim interludes of dawn and dusk. Well before sunset, the journeying birds descend to some remembered resting place en route. They fish for renourishment and then settle down in trees and on a rock or on a rock ledges for the night. The next morning they fish again and then lift above the dewy haze one by one to push on. If the weather is clear, these daylight flyers will travel a hundred or more miles before another night of rest. A favor, favorite stopover is the island of Amaknak, a four day journey from their mainland territories, if they don't linger. Amaknak is also the final destination and winter residence for many of the eagles. As it comes into sight, they wheel toward its green and rocky hills. On descent, primary flight feathers splay and twist, tail feathers pitch upward and downward. Horizontal wings dance on fickle air currents. Heads dip forward and keen eyes pick out landing spots as each nimble bird floats in. Legs reach down and toes spread to meet the upward surging ground in a near balletic landing. Wings close as a final bow. Thank you. You're welcome. Jack, I have to say that these, uh, these passages in, in the book, which occur throughout the book, that, that sort of occur almost from the eagle's perspective, are some of my very favorite parts of it. And I, I wondered how you, how do you approach putting yourself in the mind of an eagle? You know, that, 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 that's a, uh, thanks for making that observation because uh, I was I really try to do that I I I, I like for nature in, in my books to be um, an active agent in in the history I'm writing about and of course that means uh, in this case the the eagles themselves and uh, I you know just learning their behavior you can pretty much uh, write from there I think you can write from their perspective. Um, and so I, I, I do do that at uh, many opportunities and, uh, you know, and I have, you know, I have, a, as you know, a good friend of mine, Cynthia Barnett, who also writes, um, uh, does environmental history and, and writes uh, natural histories. And um, she, she and I are, call each other writing partners. We don't co-author together, but she reads everything I write. I read everything she wrote in draft most recently her her last book the sound of the sea uh, this wonderful book about the cultural and natural history of mollusk and uh, so we challenge each other you know and uh, to to do it right and, and certainly not to anthropomorphize uh, and um, and every once in a while we catch each other doing that and we we correct the other what's wrong with anthropomorphizing well you know because the, when we do that, I think we tend to uh, do this. So we, we repeat some of the behavior that uh, of the past that I write about that may have led to um, a, we'll, we'll, well, let's put it this way, a, a relationship with the, with the species that was um, uh, not advantageous to the species. Uh, to give you an example, and it was suggested in, in the introduction, the bald eagle for you know, centuries was accused of being a rank coward and thief. You know, that's anthropomorphizing. Uh, and, and of course, Benjamin Franklin was uh, famous for those very words, as a matter of fact. 
Um, and he referred to the bald eagle as a rank coward and thief because it stole fish from osprey, and uh, which is which is quite common. And uh, you know, and so when you attach a label like that onto a species, then you are making a judgment about it. And often that judgment translates into whether it's a good species or a bad species. And for more, much more than a century, the bald eagle was considered, even while the image was a favorite image and a, and a beloved image of, 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 of America, um, the species was regarded as a bad species. And when you're put in that category with those kind of labels, coward and thief uh, and villain and, uh, uh, just uh, uh, just a whole list of uh, of descriptions, then um, that can lead to the, the the you know harm against that that species. And as you know from reading the book, um, um, Americans were guilty for a long time of uh, of of actually subjecting bald eagles to direct harm. As, as pests, as, as a threat to their livelihoods perceived or? Yes, as, as predators, they were, you know, of course they're an apex predator and they were accused of all sorts of crimes. Again, another word that was attached to bald eagles, all sorts of crimes uh, for which it was not guilty. Um, it, uh, it was was accused of flying away with all sorts of livestock, calves and pigs and, and sheep, and none of which it can lift off the ground. Um, it, it was accused of stealing chickens and a bald eagle will take chickens. Um, they can carry those away. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, even mothers were warned, don't leave your child unattended outdoors unless you want a bald eagle to carry it away to its nest. Uh, and so, um, a bald eagle scene was a bald eagle to be shot uh, throughout the you know, 18th and 19th and early on into the early 20th century. And Americans shot a lot of them, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, and Alaska had a bounty on bald eagles from um, 1917 to 1952 because it was accused of being a fish thief. Again, you know, um, anthropomorphizing the the, uh, the bird. It was unnecessary that the, that the fish belonged to us. Uh, yeah, it belonged to us. It belonged to the commercial uh, uh, fishers and, um, you know, the salmon fishers in particular. And the, the bald eagle tends to um, uh, feed on spawned out salmon, which are not marketable. Uh, and so the, the, that they were unnecessary competition for um, the salmon industry was uh, was a gross exaggeration, but it's one that led to uh, the uh, bounties being paid on over 128,000 bald eagles. Why do you think people are so willing to believe these stories when then they're manifestly not true? You know, I, I'm always I'm always dumbfounded by some of the stories we believe today. As a as a, as a matter of fact, uh, and. Um, it's, um, you know, I mean, somebody, you know, and there were all sorts of reports, even coming from anthropologists, I mean, excuse me, ornithologists saying that um, bald eagles, people witnessing bald eagles carrying away a baby. Uh, and um, which again, just simply is not true. Uh, I don't know why people um, want to believe these stories. I guess it's some, um, it's a sensation that um, breaks the boredom in their lives. <laughs> uh, and um, or and again, you know, it is true that bald eagles did steal chickens, and, and you know, we we have to remember that in the nineteenth century, you, uh, virtually everybody had raised chickens, you know, for for the eggs and for the broilers, uh, and um, so people even living in urban areas had chickens in their yards, and um, they were at risk of losing them to, you know, of course not um, uh, bald eagles alone, but. Uh, uh, many raptors, uh, hawk for, hawks, for example, or owls and, and um, all sorts of varmints. So it was, I, I, I suppose it was an easy solution was just kill them all. Um, and uh, somehow people are able to separate in the mind that when they were killing a bald eagle, they were killing the living bird behind their, 
you know, the, 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 a symbol, an important symbol of the United States. Ironically, symbol of freedom, this bird of freedom was being denied its own freedom by the people of this free nation. Do you think there was just, there was an idea that no matter what, there were always going to be more? Uh, that's certainly a possibility, but by the late 19th century, um, bald eagles were all but missing in action from the Eastern seaboard states, um, with the exception of Florida and, um, and many of the Midwestern states, places where they had been um, very common before. Give you an example, in 1782, when, when um, Continental Congress a meeting in Philadelphia uh, put the bald eagle on the great seal of the United States, making it a national symbol. And again, a symbol that Americans fell in love with immediately. There were probably um, eagles nests every mile to two miles along the Delaware River. But by the late 19th century, uh, they, they, you couldn't find one. Uh, and so, um, and ironically, Americans thought by that time that bald eagles were Rocky Mountain birds, uh, yet they uh, commonly lived, had lived uh, uh, all over the, uh, the, the, you know, North America uh, and, and, and all across the 48 uh, states, the lower 48 states in Alaska. But you reveal early in the book that uh, uh, the United States does not, in fact, have a national bird. How is yes. that possible? <laughs> How does that happen? Yeah, uh, that's that's correct. Um, the, um, the, the Congress has never designated a national bird as it has a national mammal, which is the bison, or in the national flower, which is the rose, and the national tree, which is which is the oak. Um, but the um, the um, for all these years since 1782, the the bald eagle is really sort of uh, um, uh, bask in this um, fallacious uh, identity as, as the national bird. There are even government, US government websites that identify the bald eagle as a national bird, but it again, has never been confirmed. Tomorrow, Congress could uh, anoint uh, the, uh, the sidewalk pigeon as, as the national bird. I mean, of course, we hope they don't, won't, uh, it makes all, all the sense in the world for it to designate the bald eagle as the national bird. Do you, do, you, do you see qualities in the bald eagle that make it an especially good emblem for the United States? I do. I, I, I actually do. Um, you know, to us, and this is where you can anthropomorphize because this is really is, is, um, talking about a cultural relationship with the bird. But to us, it's a very charismatic bird. Um, and it's easily identifiable. You know, uh, eagles have been on uh, coats of arms and nation state seals dating back to the ancient Greeks and Romans. But all those eagles are non-ornithological. They're non, they're, they represent no specific species. The bald eagle is the first um, um, uh, eagle to go on an, a nation state seal that isn't an identifiable species. And again, it's an easily identifiable one. But it's also, it's truly an all-American bird. Um, it lives only in North America. So that made it idea, ideal for the seal at a time when the United States was really trying to assert its, its, in, uh, its uh, identity separate of, of, um, of Great Britain and, and even France. Uh, and so to have this uh, bird that's endemic to North America made a lot of sense. The other thing is that, you know, the bald eagle does convey, you know, courage and strength um, and and uh, and freedom again, uh, from our perspective, and uh, and it has that bony suborbital ridge uh, above its eyes that are act as a sun visor for the bald eagle. But to us, that's the ideal. Don't tread on me stare. So I think it, I I don't you know Charles Thompson the. The, uh, the secretary of the Continental Congress, the one who came up with the, the idea to put the bald eagle on the national seal. Um, uh, I, I think he, he picked, uh, I think it was the right pick. It was an ingenious idea. I don't know, I might go with, with the turkey vulture, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll concede for you on this one. I really like turkey vultures. That's not, that's not a slight against, uh, against the country. Although don't, wouldn't Canada and Mexico have an equal claim on, on the bald eagle though? No, now Mexico has the golden eagle. 
yeah. uh, on, on its seal. And uh, so we're the, we're the only ones that have the, the, the bald eagles. That, it, they could, yes, they could. Um, uh, bald, there are more bald eagles living, many more bald eagles living in Canada than in Mexico. They only live in Northern Mexico and their, their numbers are, are not sizable, but the, the golden eagle makes more sense. It's more um, prominent in, in, in Mexico. But Canada, you know, uh, you know, they're just part of the Commonwealth. You know, they don't count. So no, no, no offense to Canadians. I mean, I, I'm sure that <laughs> we're too close to the Canadian, or at least Powell's is too close to the Canadian border for me to be saying something like that. But now, how did you how did you happen in the story of Old Abe? And and for our audience, who was he? So Old Abe was a living bird uh, who was hatched who hatched in 1861 in uh, northern Wisconsin. And he was eventually, he, and he was taken from his nest uh, by a Chippewa Indian and then uh, through a couple of uh, trades um, down the line, he, uh, Old Aid, em ended up with a, a volunteer regiment uh, from Wisconsin that went off to fight in the Civil War. And Old Aid became this regiment's mascot and accompanied the regiment uh, into battle, you know, two or three dozen times. Uh, even at Vicksburg, you know, one of the one of the uh, toughest battles fought during the war, and uh, survived. Uh, and after uh, the war, he was discharged and um, given to the the state of Wisconsin. And when he was given two apartments in the basement of the the Capitol building. Um, painted red, white, and blue with, with white stars. Uh, and he became an ambassador for the state and for Civil War veterans used in, 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 in you take it around the country and uh, uh, to various uh, uh, events to, to raise money for um, uh, orphans and, and Civil War widows and Civil War veterans. Uh, so I happened upon him it wasn't hard. He's had something like eight biographies written about him. Really? Yes. And so it wasn't hard to happen upon old Abe. Uh, and, um, and I'm sure somebody probably uh, uh, told me or emailed at some point and said, you got to write about old Abe. You, you have to write about old Abe. Uh, and he, he was interesting because he was, he was a living version of the symbol of the United States. I write about how bald eagles during the 19th century uh, were forced to exist in two universes, the symbol universe and the species universe. And they were treated differently. And, you know, one was the, the, the symbol universe, they were embraced and loved and the species universe, they were shot, they were hated and shot, uh, eradicated. And uh, old Abe um, sort of brought those two universes, universes, he embodied both of those uh, the, those universes. He was loved, but yet he was a living species. But at the same time, he wasn't a free species. He was he was he was a living he was a living symbol as a species. Yeah, but also, also basically a, a slave. That's exactly right. A bird of freedom that was that had been denied uh, his freedom. Yeah, and ultimately, you know, as buildings did in those days, the the Capitol building burned twice. Um, and uh, the first time it, it burned, old Abe, who, according to lore, sounded the alarm about the fire, um, died of smoke inhalation. And but the state couldn't let him go, so they mounted him and uh, and displayed him in a glass box up on the main floor of the Capitol building. So thus he emerged out of the basement uh, and made it to the main floor. And then the Capitol building burned again in 1914, as I recall, and. His, his remains were lost in, in that fire. And I essentially say it, it was this, as if uh, the, the living symbol was not supposed to exist. Yeah, changing gears a little bit, you talk about you know, the, the struggle against DDT, uh, which was such a, a watershed moment in the environmental movement in the United States. I was wondering, do you think it was in a way fortunate that DDT worked so fast? Like if it had been over a couple of generations, it might the the effects were slower. We might not have noticed in time. You know, I never thought about that, but that that that's a possibility. And you're right; it, it did work really fast. You know, the irony is that 
1940, Congress passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act because Americans were uh, of, uh, concerned by the early 20th century that the, the living species behind this, uh, this powerful symbol in the United States was at risk of going the way of the passenger pigeon, you know, which went extinct in, when the last one died in 1914. And so Congress recognized the duplicity of allowing the killing of the, the living species while, uh, um, you know, of course, exalting this, this symbol. And they were in the, the country was a year away from going uh, to war against fascist tyranny. And it would have been a disgraceful um, uh, if we had lost the, the living species. It would have undermined the integrity of the symbol. That's even written in the legislation, the 1940 legislation for the Bald Eagle Protection Act. But five years later, what happens? DDT is released to the general market. And within a few years, it's, it blankets the lower 48 states. I mean, it's used not just in agriculture and, and forestry, but also in people's homes. You know, you could go down to the grocery store and, and, uh, and buy various versions of, uh, of, of DDT. And Americans loved it to control insects. So the bald eagle, many other birds and fish light too, became collateral damage of the widespread use of DDT. And you're right, it happened really quickly. People who, one person in Florida who was, it was banning eaglets through the 1950s saw the population drop precipitously um, and became immediately became concerned. And he's the first person, Charles Broly was his name, who I write about in the book, interesting guy, um, a retired banker from Winnipeg uh, who decided he wanted to ban eaglets, climb tall pine trees and ban eaglets in his retirement. Uh, he was the first one to make a connection between DDT and the decline of the bald eagle population. And for, for, for people who don't know, uh, what, what did DDT do um, that caused the population of eagles to decline? So it, it does a couple of things. One, it wreaks havoc with the habitat, you know, because it, you know, while it was harmful to bird life, which most of us are familiar with, or anybody who's read Rachel Carson's book, uh, Silent Spring, it also devastated fish life. Uh, the bald eagle will eat birds, it'll eat land animals, but it's started as a fishing raptor and it prefers to eat fish. It builds its nest uh, within, you generally within 100, within 100 yards of, of, of water. And so the habitat uh, it was uh, devastated by DDT, but also by you know, other forms of pollution, including wastewater, which was uh, out of control in the mid 20th century. Um, but also in, in, in with the DDT, DDT um, uh, penetrating the aquatic life, um, bald eagles were eating DDT, uh, you know, um, infected fish. Uh, and so the DDT was getting into their system and then metabolizing into DDE, E as an echo. And the DDE is actually what uh, caused the damage. It got into the bloodstream of the females and into uh, their, their, their shell gland. And so they were, and this is true with other birds too. Uh, it, uh, you know, it, so they were laying uh, adult eggs or deformed eggs or eggs with, uh, within shells um, that just simply didn't hatch or just not uh, laying as many eggs as they had before. So nests had fewer eggs and fewer, and their, their success rate uh, and their hatch uh, uh, of, of hatching uh, decline significantly. What are the, the threats that, the, the biggest threats that eagles face now? So the biggest threat that eagles face now is lead poisoning. Uh, same for the California condor, which many of those who are listening uh, uh, may be familiar with. Um, and it's, it, the lead comes from hunting, you know, from lead shot and, and uh, pellets, uh, lead shots and bullets. And you know, hunters are some of our, our, you know, original and best, you know, most devoted conservationists. And many hunters who engage in big game hunting, and of course, in America, that means an elk or a deer. Uh, and uh, they, they typically kill their, uh, um, excuse me, um, gut their kill in the woods. And it makes sense, you know, keep it in the environment and let the scavengers feed on it. Well, bald eagles are our famous scavengers. Uh, and unfortunately, those gut piles have 
uh, traces of lead in them. And a lead shard the size of a, a grain of rice can, can kill a bald eagle. And uh, unfortunately, that's their, uh, their number one threat right now is, is lead poisoning. Uh, but there are car strikes. You know, the bald eagle population, one reason why I wrote this book, Jonathan, is that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't see very many bald eagles. And now we see them all the time. Uh, and it's an exciting uh, for us to do. I call it a, you know, a poke the guy in the ribs next to you, a, a moment of excitement uh, when you see a bald eagle crossing the sky. And uh, the, the population quadrupled in the 2010s. And now continent-wide is around 500,000 uh, 500, uh, bald eagles in, in North America. And uh, practically the same number that was estimated to uh, exist at the time that the Europeans began settling North America. And so I, since we're seeing the bald eagle so frequently now, I thought readers might want to know a little bit about this bird and its history with the, with the American people. So as its population continues to thrive and expand, and our own continues to thrive and expand, there are going to be increasing you know, confrontations, unfortunately, between human activities uh, and, and bald eagles, car strikes, for instance, um, um, you know, electrocution from flying into uh, uh, power lines. Um, the power industry has, electric power industry has done, has really risen to the occasion and done a good job with its uh, wind sites and wind generators by installing uh, technology that can detect when birds uh, and, and bald eagles and golden eagles are in the, in the area and slow down or stop those uh, turbine blades, which weighs several tons, by the way. Um, and so we've seen since um, technology has been installed in wind generators, uh, yeah, yeah, eagle deaths from collision with those blades uh, drop dramatically, 80% in some places. Did, uh, what do you think that eagles have, or do you see from their behavior now uh, that they've learned how to deal with us better? Yeah, that's a, that's a really, I, I like that question, Jonathan, because um, at one time scientists didn't, when, you know, when there were, you know, in 1963, a census, a NESC census was conducted across the North America, the lower 48 states, and uh, um, only 487 were found. So that's the nadir. And so through the 60s and into the 70s, there's just not a lot of bald eagles around. In the 70s and 80s, scientists is focusing on trying to restore the population. And uh, we didn't have a lot of experience with the bald eagle, or science didn't, um, because it hadn't been around. And so scientists thought that bald eagles would not be willing to live next nearby people um, within you know, proximity of them, uh, like, for instance, coyotes and, and, uh, and raccoons do. And what we've learned as this population has grown is that they're happy to be around us. Uh, as long as we don't harm them, of course, and we don't want to harm them. Uh, we like the bald eagle now. And, um, and so it's, you know, people are seeing them uh, building on their, you know, in their backyards, on their golf courses, at, at the local school campus, uh, and uh, they're everywhere. And as, for example, raccoons have really, and coyotes too, have really thrived around human populations because those they're scavengers. Uh, bald eagles are starting to do that too. They're uh, as scavengers. One of the best places to see a bald eagle, um, well, maybe not one of the best, but if you're a sure bet to see a bald eagle, go to the local town um, landfill or dump um, because they're out there with the gulls and, and, uh, uh, and all the other birds that are, uh, the, uh, that are um, scavenging on our waste. So we've laid out this smorgasbord for them. In many ways, your book reads not just like a book about eagles or about a species of bird, but it's a, it's a capsule history of the United States from European colonization to now through the eyes of the eagle. What, was that always your intention when you, when you set out to write the book? Yes, I always knew that I wanted to do this sweeping history. I wanted to, I you know, was interested in the bald eagles 
relationship with the American people. But as an environmental historian, my interest isn't only on the, the human impact on nature, but also how nature shapes uh, the course of, of human history. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's important to me, as I mentioned earlier, to treat um, you know, uh, nature or members of nature outside of humans as, 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 as historical agents. Um, as actually, you know, not, not just simply being acted upon, but also conducting their, you know, their own sovereign activities, if you will, but um, activities that uh, sometimes have an impact on us. What would you like your readers to see when they see a bald eagle? When they see one in the sky? Yeah. I like for them to see a species that is a persevering species. Uh, a species that um, has what you might call the ideal family values, um, as mentioned earlier. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to go that far with you, but okay. <laughs> well, I guess it's, yeah, well, uh, the, uh, well, let me, let me explain why. Uh, okay. As it was mentioned in the introduction, they're monogamous. They mate for life. Uh, they maintain a fidelity to the same nest. As long as that nest exists, um, the male and the female return to that nest every breeding season and they add on to it. Um, so they're good housekeepers, they're good home renovators. I like that about them because I'm, I'm a home renovator too. Uh, persistent, you know, just endless. And, uh, you know, people ask me, when are you going to finish your project? And I say, never. And it's the same with the bald eagle. They never finish. They're, they're refurbishing every, every... So they'll spend the first few weeks when they return to their breeding territory um, refurbishing those nests. And they end up getting bigger and bigger and bigger over the years. There's one, as you may recall in the book, there's one nest that I write about uh, from the 1920s that was 35 years old. This is in northern Ohio on, uh, on Lake Erie. The uh, nest reached uh, some 10 feet across and 12 feet deep. And eventually the old hickory that it was in said enough is enough uh, and collapsed uh, with a little help from a, uh, a storm off the lake. Uh, and the scientists who had been uh, observing the couple that occupied that nest um, estimated that the nest weighed two tons. So that's how big they get. But the other thing is that the care for the young uh, with um, such devotion that uh, they feed them so well that by the time they leave their natal territory between 16 and 20 weeks of age, um, the young uh, typically weigh more than the parents. Um, and um, so that's, and if, if a mate is lost, if, if a mate loses his partner, it'll immediately go out and find a new one. You know, it has this very strong instinct to um, um, to, uh, to survive, to procreate and survive. I have a question here. It's, uh, do, do bald eagles ever attack people? And if so, what generally provokes such an attack? Well, in the prologue of the book, I, I, I mentioned this uh, one eagle that uh, swooped down in, um, in, and this was in Dutch Harbor, Alaska. And this actually appeared in a New York Times uh, magazine article years ago. Uh, a bald eagle swooped down in grabbed a slice of pizza out of a boy's 16 year old boy's hand. Uh, and um, so there we have a pizza thief, if we can anthropomorphize, but, uh, but and also there, there were uh, a pair and um, built a nest on the Dutch Harbor, um, the roof of the Dutch Harbor post office. And when people went to go check their PO box, um, when there were eaglets and eggs in the nest, the, the eagles would attack the, uh, um, you know, the people coming to get their mail to the point that some started wearing hard hats. But um, typically, no. I mean, it's, it's, um, they will sound a warning call. They will, they, you know, like some birds that will mob you if you get into their territory, like a jay uh, will swoop down and come after you um, to try to scare you. Bald eagles, it, you know, they're, as you know, each bird has its own individual personality. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some will, you know, defend in a more aggressive manner than, than others, defend their territory in a more aggressive manner than the other. But, you know, 
we, we don't have to worry about our children being carried away by bald eagles. Um, and uh, uh, possibly cats, and people are concerned about that. You know, I, we just don't know yet how bald eagles are, you know, as their population expands and they become uh, more um, adapted to, you know, uh, uh, suburban areas. We just don't know how they're going to react to our pets. You know, let me, let me say something, Jonathan. There are all kinds of doctored videos on YouTube um, with uh, bald eagles stealing away kids and, and, uh, and animals two, three times their size. And they're, they're, they're just completely bogus. The bald eagle, a large bald eagle with momentum behind it can lift about five pounds off the ground. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't think it's much of a threat to us. Are there are there eagle cultures? I mean, are there are there eagles that specialize on certain kinds of food in certain areas? Like, are there some that re places where they've learned to you know raid dumpsters behind restaurants, for instance, and they they teach their young how to do that? Um, well, the young observe it. They're not necessarily being taught by their parents. They're not they're not taught by their parents how to fish, for example. Um, but they do observe, uh, and it takes a young uh, a while to really learn how to become excuse me, expert fishers. Uh, there's a lot of trial and error for them. But yes, they will. You know, again, they, they are scavengers. They're opportunists. And, and, you know, and, and of course, Franklin criticized them for, for that. But scientists see that as smart behavior, you know, because what do animals do in the wild? They conserve and they eat. They conserve energy and they eat. They conserve energy and they eat. And so scavenging scavenging is a way of conserving energy and so if they find food in a dumpster and I write about this one um, uh, incident in again in Dutch Harbor um, somebody had a box of fish I can't remember I, salmon or something in the back of his pickup went into the Safeway to go grocery shopping and it comes out and there's a convocation of bald eagles gathered around <laughs> that have gotten into the, his box and his fish um, and so um, they're, they're smart in that way, but there are um, places where um, the bald eagle population have, has reached uh, the size that the, uh, there's, has, there's not, there are not enough fish going around to go around to feed everybody. So in places like that, the bald eagles may be um, focusing their efforts more on land animals. And in fact, we do know that's the case, um, that in, in places where finish, uh, the fish population has uh, become diminished or there's so much competition uh, that bald eagles are starting to eat less fish and more land animals than, than they would if, the, if there were enough fish around. We have another question. Uh, I was fascinated by an eagle nest display I saw several years ago at a museum in Juneau, Alaska. Is that a typical nest? Have you seen this display? Uh, I've seen other ones. I have not seen the one in Juneau, um, but I have seen others. And what I, the ones I've seen are, are, are very good replication. The, the size of the twigs or the sticks, not really twigs, the sticks are quite large. As I, as I write in the book, they're, you know, they're, they're uh, cigar sized fat. Uh, and they're long and, um, and they're quite intricate. Uh, intricate. They, uh, uh, they're, they're woven. The, the, the birds, you know, they'll take a stick and they'll place it in uh, one way and not like it. And they'll pick it up and turn it around and move it around. Um, they, they fit things together. They're, um, they're, they're pretty doggone good uh, contractors. A uh, question, how did you start writing the book? Uh, was it at the start of the, the history or somewhere else? Is what the, um, I think this is a question about sort of where do you begin a project like this in some ways? Yeah, um, no, I I'd always envisioned this as the history and I'm a historian um, and, you know, my last book on the Gulf of Mexico was an environmental history or is an environmental history of the Gulf of Mexico. And so this is going to be a, you know, more or less a, um, a biography of the bald eagle or a cultural and natural history of the bald eagle focusing on its relationship with the American people and, and native peoples um, and uh, and focusing also on the United States. So I started, you know, I started at the beginning looking at, uh, to look at, I, I started by looking at 
Native American relationships with bald eagles prior to the coming of Europeans, uh, and then started it, and then moved from there to the colonial period. But what was what was the uh, this is me asking this question? What is what was the first scene that you wrote? Do you remember? Um, actually, I um, as I recall, the first scene I probably wrote was the one of Dutch Harbor because I have in that in those opening paragraphs that I read, I have bald eagles migrating from the mainland to uh, Lucian Islands in, in Dutch Harbor, specifically mm -hmm. Macnac. It's on a Dutch Harbor is on um, a Macnac Island. And so that's the first scene, how they interact in the 21st century, bald eagles interact with the people of Dutch, Dutch Harbor. Uh, and, but I should say those paragraphs I read were the last paragraphs I wrote for the book. Um, and that's, uh, that's the way it, it's usually the way it has been with my, my books is, um, you know, as you know, you want to get those opening paragraphs, those opening words, they want them to be just right. And it took me months um, yeah. to, 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 to write that, you know, revision after revision after revision. How do you know when you're done? You know, um, I think with the bald eagle it was easier than the, than the gulf of mexico because the bald eagle's life is is um is pretty well structured you know and there's a there's a structure that you're able to follow when you're writing a biography whether it's of a place or of, of a person or or in this case a, a bird and you know i knew i wanted to bring it up to the present um and and i i as i was writing the book you know, a new study was released announcing that the bald eagle population had quadrupled during the 2010s. So I thought, what a great, you know, place to end. Um, but also, I want, I also wanted to end with the, um, the current size of the population continent wide. And just coincidentally, it happens to be, you know, the, you know, around 500,000 equivalent to the estimated size of the population at the time of European contact. So seemed to, it just fell at the end, just fell into place in this, in the case of this book, I think. So that was sort of a marker that you knew you could aim towards your, this is, you know. Yeah, you I, yeah, I don't, I don't know about you. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure how the book will end until I get there. You know, some, some authors know exactly where the book will end at the time they start writing. But I've never been like that. What about you uh, when you wrote about the Caracara? Did you know it was going to, to end where it did? In Florida, actually, as it happened. Um, no, I had no idea. Yeah, um, yeah. The, I, I, the, the part of, in my book there, you know, William Henry Hudson is sort of this character who, who yeah. knit the whole thing together. And uh, I only mentioned him in my proposal in just a, a sentence. And my editor, wow. Jonathan Siegel, said, um, you you should look more closely here. I think there's more there. Yeah, it's about all that he said. Um, but he was unfortunately, um, or, or, or very irritatingly, right uh, about that as and about many other things. Um, but that really helped me find a, a. But you had a good time writing about him. I could tell that. And oh, I loved it. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Once I got into Hudson, it was. Yeah, good. yeah. Right, um, right. I mean, I, I think you're probably the same as I. I just put together these very loose outlines of my chapters. Um, many people put these really rigid outlines and they follow them like they're following a traffic cop. And, um, but I have just very loose outlines. I'm not sure of everything that will be in it or who will be in it until I sit down and start writing. And I, I like to you know, grab onto a thread and follow that and see where it leads me. I want the history to show me how it wants to be written. And consequently, you know, surprises pop up, interesting characters uh, like William and Henry Hudson, or in, in the case of my book, uh, you know, Doris Mager and, and, and uh, 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 j just so many other, Francis Herrick, the scientist who measured that two ton uh, nest and um, the things about John James Audubon that I didn't know, but those things I'm learning as I'm writing these chapters. And so there's, there's something spontaneous about the writing that makes it exciting because 
they're plot twists that, if you will, that you don't expect. And it just makes it exciting and fun. How do you know when you've got a lead that you want to follow? Um, when it seems to, this sounds perhaps a little um, uh, facile or glib, but when it seems to want to write itself, and then I know, then I know I've got a good lead. Uh, and, um, you know, what I was writing about Doris Magger, who, for those who don't know, she was uh, involved in the restoration of bald eagles in the late 20th century, early on. Um, and it was a big promoter of, uh, of their, their cause, if you will, of raptors generally, not, not uh, simply bald eagles. But, you know, the more I learned about her, the more fascinating she became, the more fun she became to write about. And uh, so I, I knew I had the right thread there. Uh, because I think she's an engaging character for 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 the readers. Yeah, it, well, the the book sort of it hands off from person to person to person. So it it um, or or to the eagles or there, there's always a, a I feel like there's always a a focal point that's a character that the story kind of reveals itself through. Yeah, I, I that's that that's the generally my style. That's how I wrote the Gulf book. While nature really is the you know, the main character, and I treat nature, and in the, obviously in this book, uh, Bald Eagles is the main characters. There are these others that help drive the narrative, uh, help give it shape. And, um, uh, and I, I was fortunate to run across a lot of interesting uh, um, characters. I would have loved to have found a number of old Abe type characters. I loved writing that section in which uh, old Abe could, you know, clearly be the central character and the the humans were really the minor in, in, in his biography, really the very minor players. Um, but, but in other cases, humans really uh, emerged to be principal characters along with bald eagles, which is fine. That's a, that's a really way I, I see the history anyway. I wanted to open it up for any more questions um, that anybody might have for Jack. Don't have any at the moment. I think we've gotten to them all. Jack, was there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to make sure that we discussed? Yeah, I mean, I should point out that talk about a little bit about the, the native relationship with bald eagles, and which is interesting. There are a lot of parallels between the American treatment of bald eagles and American treatment of Indians in the, in the history of the United States that people aren't aware of. And, um, you know, for many native groups, um, the, the bald eagle uh, has, uh, uh, it does does now, but has for thousands of years been a um, a spirit bird, you know, a messenger bird, a bird that delivers messages uh, messages from uh, uh, you know from the people to their their dead ancestors or to the the creator, and so bald eagle feathers and and body parts have long been important in their rituals and ceremonies and, and native peoples, um, uh, native groups for, for whom the, the bald eagles, the spirit bird, have often had a, a designated eagle catcher or, e or eagle killer who would go out and take eagles from the, the, the wild, you know, few in number, uh, not, not so many that it would have an impact on their, even their local population. Uh, and they would go through these elaborate rituals before they would take a, a bald eagle and after they, they, they took an eagle. Uh, and so when Congress passed the 1940 Bald Eagle uh, the Act, uh, the Bald Eagle Protection Act, may outlawing, uh, making it uh, illegal to harm a bald eagle, you could, you could receive jail time you, and a huge fine at the same time for harming a bald eagle. The... Uh, uh, Congress exempted uh, Alaska's bald eagle bounty from the Bald Eagle Protection Act, but it did not exempt uh, traditional native behavior. And so ultimately what the act did was criminalize Native American um, traditional, ancient Native American relationships with the bald eagle. Um, Indians can no longer take uh, eagles out of the wild. But 
um, since the restoration of bald eagles after DDT, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has, has worked hard to try to heal that relationship, you know, yeah, and uh, to uh, a lot. In fact, we have you, people probably know that today. If you find a bald eagle feather, you're not by law. You're not allowed to keep it. Uh, and if you find a dead eagle on the side of the road, you're you're required to uh, turn it into the authority. Same with the feather. Um, and the authorities will eventually get it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but then send it to its uh, the National Eagle Repository in Denver, where bald eagle parts and feathers are processed and then distributed to Native Americans who applied for parts and, and feathers. And so that's one way we try to mend um, uh, our relationship with Native peoples um, by uh, respecting um, and facilitating their relationship, traditional relationships with, with bald eagles. I write in the book that we could not fully reconcile our own relationship with bald eagles until we reconciled our relationship with native peoples and their, uh, their bald eagle rituals. And that's one way we're doing. Fish and Wildlife also does allow uh, uh, some select uh, native peoples to take a small number of bald eagles from the wild. I have one uh, uh, question here uh, that I don't know if we can sort of tie it up with this question, but there might be a way. Uh, I occasionally see crows mobbing eagles. Why don't the eagles take them to the ground instead of flying away? Well, um, it's, um, uh, I don't know why they don't. I, I, I think as far as I know, they're laughing inside at the crows, but um, <laughs> Um, but then if to say that I would be anthropomorphizing, wouldn't I? And, uh, but it's not just crows that will mob bald eagles, titmouse, you know, these the small little birds uh, will, will mob uh, bald eagles when they come into their, their territory. Um, I, I, I suppose, and Jonathan, maybe you might have an answer to this because I'm speculating. I suppose it's, it, it's all about energy, conserving energy. It just wouldn't be worth the bald eagles the energy it, it would expend to take down uh, a, a crow um, because it, it, that wouldn't stop the other crows from continuing. Like, to ugh, you're not with the trouble. Never mind. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, they, they, yeah, yeah, exactly right. You know, and uh, this. I mean, on the one hand, this is this is um, a clever strategy on the part of the crows because they're working together. Yes. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, it's a it's a you know, good judgment on the part of the eagle of like, I'm not going to beat these guys. It, I can't do it. Uh, I'm just going to find, I'm going to occupy myself elsewhere. I have a question about, there's a concern about the negative impact on the hatching of seabirds off the Oregon coasts. Uh, is there any, any possibility of controls on eagles in this area? Is, is this something you know, that you- Yeah, that's, the yeah. That, that is the, uh, the question of the hour. Um, and for instance, those who are scientists who are and, and wildlife officials who uh, are trying to restore the plover population, for instance, are, are often frustrated by eagles. Um, and, um, and so it's interesting, you have this great American conservation success story, that would be the bald eagle. Um, screwing up, a, you know, other conservation efforts, you know, the collision of uh, two types of conservation. Uh, um, it's uncertain what, you, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has to make the, the ultimate decision about what to do, whether to try to control or quote unquote manage those eagles who are making it difficult for certain bird or animal populations to, um, uh, to uh, make a comeback. And uh, so it's, We'll have to wait to see what happens. This is this is the sequel. It's the <laughs> this, could, this could be a sequel. So this is one of the things I talk about in the book that yeah. you know we have these we have new challenges because as their population is coming back, and are we going to start? And there are these confrontations between bald eagles and us, and the restoration of a bird population is one such confrontation. Um, are we going to start, is Will Fish and Wildlife say, we need to start managing the population? And you know what managing means? It means culling. You know, we do that with black bears now. Uh, and um, 
you know, we have hunting seasons in my state and other states on, on black bears um, because of those confrontations. And uh, so I worry that that will happen with the bald eagle. Jack, we've just about reached the end of the, the hour here. Um, it, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you for, for talking with me about this. And um, there's, there's many more stories to enjoy in your book uh, about the bald eagle and the various uh, people who've, who've dealt with it in one way or another uh, over the last couple of hundred years in this country. Uh, and about the sort of the, the way that the country is, the, the parts of the country has, have seen themselves reflected in the, in the bird. I really, I really appreciate you spending the time. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for uh, taking the time to uh, chat with me. It's been it's been a lot of fun, uh, and writing the book is is as was the case for you and yours. It, you know, it was a labor of love, and uh, so and I, I really came to admire the bald eagle. I didn't know much about it before I started writing this book. Well, thank you both uh, so much for tonight's talk. This is the book, The Bald Eagle. And I put a link uh, to it in the chat just now. So click on that link and order it from us. Um, there's also Jonathan's book right here. Just come out and paperback. Yes, great book, great book. Yeah, her book. And uh, I'm also going to put a link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Uh, this event was recorded and will be showing up on our YouTube page uh, sometime tomorrow. So if you have friends that missed it or you wanna share it with people, uh, feel free to click on that. And you can see all of our past events there as well. Lots of really um, outstanding talks that we've had the past couple of years on the Zoom channels. Uh, thanks again, Jonathan and Jack. And thanks everyone at home for yes. viewing from everyone at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Have a great night. <laughs>